I'm Daniel Skuka for USA Web TV. We're in Belgium at European Space Weather Week, and I'm speaking today with Manuela Temer from the University of Graz in Austria and Richard Horn from the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. Thank you very much for joining us. Manuela, my first question is for you. Uh, the sun uh, undergoes some incredible uh, uh, periodic variations and changes. Can you tell us a little bit about what happens with our sun? Right, so our sun has seasons, just like we have on the Earth, uh, some weather seasons. It's, uh, in principle, we have an 11 year long cycle. So uh, this cycle is um, covering increased activity and decreased activity. So in total, it's an 11 year duration on average. Um, uh, this increased activity is usually related to uh, strong flare emissions. So bright spots, uh, brightness uh, increases um, at the surface and uh, coupled to that uh, coronal mass ejection, so which are huge explosions from the sun that uh, can also propagate towards Earth and then interact with the uh, Earth magnetosphere, for example. Now I understand that during the, 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 the season of high activity, we're actually seeing more spots on the sun. Can you tell us a little bit about these spots? What, what are they actually? So sunspots are strong magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. They um, represent cooler regions compared to the ambient. Uh, that's why they appear uh, darker. They can accumulate a lot of uh, energy, magnetic energy. And uh, if there are some um, disruptions in the magnetic field, they can release that magnetic uh, energy abruptly. And that leads then to flares and also coronal mass ejections. And that's what we see uh, happening when we see these incredible images of the sun. We saw this activity on what we see as the, the surface. It's, it's flaring and it's these coronal mass ejections coming towards us. Coronal mass ejections are huge plasma clouds uh, and magnetic fields that are able to propagate towards Earth. So space weather is uh, the radiation and also the plasma clouds when they reach Earth and when they cause uh, a lot of effects. So those effects uh, can be um, aurorae. So to say a nice, uh, nice space weather effect. But we also have uh, increased uh, radiation doses, uh, especially important for uh, aviation people. Uh, we see variations in the Earth magnetic field. So this is uh, usually measured by um, a so-called KP index. So we see uh, really the magnetic field. If you would go out with a compass, um, you would see the needle of the compass varying over a certain time range. And uh, this can cause um, pipeline erosion. Uh, we also have increased uh, uh, currents in uh, power lines mm -hmm. and uh, this can eventually also lead to failures of, uh, of power. How does space weather affect uh, these satellites in orbit? Okay well I mean space weather starts with the sun but all the impacts are felt around the earth and satellites are really one important factor in that. So there's something like uh, 1600 satellites on orbit right now and maybe just about half of those are actually geostationary orbits. So they go around the Earth about uh, once a day, at the same, same rate that uh, the Earth rotates. So they maintain their position above the same point uh, above the Earth. So they're used mostly for sort of communications, TV, mobile phones. It's an amazing thing which we use these days. Mobile phones is like everybody's got a mobile phone, it seems. So it's really, really important for us. Our modern day life uh, depends on it. So, satellites can be damaged when, by uh, a number of different ways, but one of the most important ways is by high energy charged particles. So, the satellites orbit inside the Earth's geomagnetic field, and uh, that extends out to something like 10 Earth radii um, out on the day side of the Earth. And that acts as a, a protection for the spacecraft most of the time. But when we have one of these coronal mass ejections, what it does is it, it drags with it the magnetic field from the sun, and that then distorts the Earth's magnetic field, disrupts it, it tears apart the outer layers of the Earth's magnetic field, and you know all hell can break loose when we have a big storm. Uh, that's what happened in 2003, that's what happened in 1989. So a, we've got some really good documented example. For the average person in the street, how, how would a loss of satellite uh, services affect them? So I think interruptions to their mobile phones, that's probably the most important thing. Interruptions to GPS signals. I mean, GPS signals are used right the way across the world. It's used in transport, navigation, all kinds of things. It's even used on the stock market to uh, do timing of trading events on the New York and London Stock Exchange. Um, other examples where we, you might be affected, loss of TV. If you're broadcasting the Olympic Games and you're doing that across the world and you lose a TV signal, that's bad news. That's bad news and you know, the World Cup, that kind of thing, especially if England, England's winning. <laughs> Richard, if you could ask a solar physicist any question, what would you like to ask? Uh, what I'd really like to ask is, 
Can you tell me how long it's going to take for a coronal mass ejection to come from the sun to the earth? And how well are you going to be able to predict that? Because we really need those predictions to protect satellites. So the coronal mass ejection on average needs uh, two to three days. If we have a very fast coronal mass ejection, they are able to manage uh, below 24 hours. And that's uh, really hard to forecast. So it's in principle, if we would like to forecast coronal mass ejections, we also need to forecast flares. And uh, that's a very tricky business, uh, because for this we need to know the evolution of the magnetic field, so the sunspots that we were talking about earlier. And uh, yeah, that's really, so we haven't found uh, any algorithm yet to uh, really forecast it. So, What are some of the systems we need uh, to be able to uh, help make these early predictions of uh, coronal mass ejections and, uh, and solar flares? So um, to forecast flares and coronal mass ejections, so the major ingredient, uh, the parameter that we need to know is the magnetic field evolution. And uh, up to now we, we observe uh, the sun uh, from the Earth, so we have only the visible surface. Uh, that we can get measurements from. So we cannot uh, look around the limb, so uh, we need to go um, off the Sun-Earth line. And uh, so that means also to send a satellite to, uh, for example, the L5 Lagrange point, that's a point 60 degrees off the Sun-Earth line. And from that point, we would get the um, evolution of the magnetic field as early as possible. And uh, with that, uh, we could uh, try to forecast the flares and semis. Manuel, if you could ask an expert on how solar weather affects satellites, what would you want to ask? So, um, Richard, the question that I would like to ask is, uh, what's the lead time that you actually need to know uh, in advance uh, when a coronal mass ejection is coming? And uh, in what kind of detail you would uh, like to know the uh, variations of the magnetic field? Okay, well, as... as as far ahead as possible, I think, is, is the answer. Actually, when I talk to satellite operators, they actually say, we want to have some kind of knowledge a day in advance. And at the moment, we just can't do that for good scientific reasons. And, and we just don't have the observations uh, to do that. If we can get closer with an L5 mission, I think it would actually really, really help us. Really help us. But um, so... At the moment, I think we can only make reliable predictions, uh, something like 45 minutes, one hour out. We can stretch that to something like uh, three hours, but beyond then, our predictions become very, very uncertain. Let's put it up, because everything could change so quickly. Richard Horn and Manuela Timmer, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Daniel Skuka for ESA Web TV. For more information on ESA's activities related to space weather, follow our website at www.esa.int/spaceweather.